question again, which uh, will have to uh, be uh, answered and hopefully I'm going to answer it. I <clears throat> mentioned to you that there's a wonderful source of art, the art encyclopedia, which is at visualartscork.com. And it takes in all world of art, even prehistoric art, and whatever you want to know about art, you can find it there. Wonderful site. So here we have <clears throat> two pictures of uh, cave paintings, the so-called Franco-Cantabrian cave art, which is 40,000 to 10,000 BCE. And uh, this is on the left, you have an Altamira cave painting from around 15,000 BCE, painting of a bison. And you can see it's unbelievably lifelike, actually beautiful. And on the right, we have a cave painting from the Hall of the Bulls in Lascaux at 17,000 BCE. Well, 15,000 and 17,000 are more or less the same time, give out um, 2,000 years. But uh, <clears throat> you can see that the style is different, but it's absolutely wonderful. And so when Picasso visited Lascaux, he said, we have learned nothing in 12,000 years. And what he really said, that if you <clears throat> paint bulls, I can paint bulls too, and even can't abstract them. And in the last one, that last abstraction is just his signature. So you can see that bulls, of course, were all through history, a very, very important uh, subject, whether you went uh, to Knossos or you were in the Greeks or so on, bulls were a very, very important uh, subject all the time. And so I'm not astonished that Picasso even got involved in that. So when we talk about cave art, or another word for it is parietal art, we look at the drawings and carvings left behind by early men. The lives and behavior were affected by many outside influences. One of the most important was the climate, which determined the variety of plants and vegetation surrounding them, and also the type of animals they could hunt. In this lecture, we will survey the climate during the ice ages. Even though climate could be very cold, sudden changes of warmer periods did occur. We also will look at the migrations, which replaced one human group with another and affected the way his early ancestors lived and produced some great art around the world. Then we will look at some of the thousands of cave or rock painting, some of them, and we'll try to figure out what made the artist draw them and what they may mean. Most of the cave art we know are from Europe, but they exist on all the continents. Some of the present day aboriginals are still producing these art forms on rock surfaces. Now, a couple of three books. What is Paleolithic Art by Jean Clotte? In this book, Jean Clotte, one of the most renowned figures in the study of cave paintings, pursues an answer to the why of Paleolithic art. Discussing sites and surveys across the world, Clotte offers personal reflections on how we have viewed these paintings in the past, what we learned from looking at them across geographies, and what these paintings may have meant for the artists. Steeped in Clot's romantic theories of cave paintings, what is Paleolithic art travels from well-known Ice Age sites like Chauvet, Altamira, and Lascaux to visits with contemporary Aboriginal artists, evoking a continuum between the cave paintings of our prehistoric past and the living rock art of today. It's really amazing if you read the book that how close some of those paintings which they are producing today in Australia or in, even in um, Asia and so on are of those paintings several, ten, many 10,000 years ago. 
Another book which I recommend is The First Signs by Genevieve von Petzinger. She and April now researchers at the U of Columbia, British Columbia, uh, a groundbreaking investigation into the types, characteristics, and location of abstract signs and symbols in French cave art during the Upper Paleolithic era leads them to believe that this mysterious type of abstract cave art may in fact represent the earliest form of pictorial language. <clears throat> and I will show you some later on, and it will be really amazing to see the co correspondence between different caves and so on. And finally, an interesting other book, very recent book, Who Are We and How We Got Here? Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past, analysis of ancient DNA from prehistoric humans, paint a picture of dramatic population change in Europe from 45,000 to 7,000 years ago, according to a new study led by Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator David Reich at the Harvard Medical School. And let me say, there's an advance notice that during the coming summer, as part of Wonderful Wednesdays, I will give a lecture on ancient DNA based on the most recent discoveries. It's a fascinating subject. At least I am fascinated by it. So here we go to parietal art. In archaeology, the term parietal art, also referred to as cave art, is used to denote any prehistoric art found on cave walls. It embraces all types of cave painting, all forms of engraved rock art or other petroglyphs, as well as any relief sculpture carved on walls, floors or ceilings, artwork done on cave walls or large blocks of stone. The opposite of such immobile parietal art is mobiliary art, meaning any small scale portable art of prehistory, such as the Venus figurines or other ivory carvings, as well as jewelry and other similar items. Also parietal artworks have been found in Africa, the Middle East, India, China, Siberia, Australia, and the Americas. The main body of this form of Paleolithic art has been discovered in the 300 or so prehistoric rock shelters of southwestern France and northern Spain and formed what is known as Franco-Cantabrian cave art from 40,000 to 10,000 BCE. What's the dating? How do we date this? Some early Paleolithic scholars, such as André Leroy Gouron and Henri Breuil, developed a chronological typology of their own based upon stylistic comparisons of the parietal art examined. It's the same type of thing as they looked at the stone tools and depending on the type and the shape of the stone tools that decided that it, how old it was. When radiocarbon dating became available, the caves as well as its art and other artifacts became subject to proper scientific study. This dating is good up to 50,000 years ago. Further development in prehistoric dating technology, such as uranium thorium tests, now permit a wider range of materials and types of art to be dated with a corresponding rise in historical accuracy. These uh, dates can go back to several hundred thousand to a million years. So uh, between the radiocarbon dating and the uranium thorium tests, you can actually date things which you find in caves and so on very quite accurately going way, way back. Now, what type of parietal art? As mentioned above, this category of Stone Age art includes cave painting, typically colored with red ochre and other earthy colors, cave drawings, typically involving charcoal drawings and outlines in manganese, figurative rock engravings, typically executed with flints or other sharp tools, abstract signs in the form of geometric symbols and other markings, including aviforms, claviforms, half circles, lines, tectiforms, quadrangles, tectiforms, and zigzags, and we'll see them later, and immovable sculpture, that is, reliefs. 
The upper periodic in the Franco-Cantabrian region, these are the different dates, what they call the Chateau Peronian culture, was located around central and southwestern France and northern Spain. It represents a period of overlap between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. This culture lasted from approximately 45,000 to 40,000 before present, or 40, um, 2,000 longer in uh, BCE. The Orinaceian culture was located in Europe and Southwest Asia. Southwest Asia is the uh, Middle East, basically, and flourished between 43,000 and 36,000 before present. Then it takes place a Gravettian culture, which was located across Europe. Gravettian sites generally stayed between 33,000 and 20,000 before present. All these names came from certain great uh, places where they found certain tools and skeletons and so on, and th that the name of the, where they came from. The Solutrian culture was located in Eastern France, Spain, and England. Solutrian artifacts have been dated from 22 to 17,000 before present. And the Magdalenian culture left evidence from Portugal to Poland during the period from 17,000 to 12,000 before present. So you can see that there is a continuum of different cultures, five of them in this case, all from 45,000 to 12,000 before present. That's a long period of time. In Central and Eastern Europe, they cause them slightly differently. 33,000 BP, the Gravettian culture in Southern Ukraine, 30,000 around Silesian culture, 22, the Pavlovian and Orinacian cultures in, in uh, Slavic lands, 13,000 in Ahrensburg culture, Western Germany, Netherlands, England, and 12,000 BP Epigravettian culture. So don't have to worry about it. I just want to, for completion, I mentioned these. Nearly all the figurative pictures are representations of animals. At first, during the Orinacian era, a sizable percentage were predators, lions, bears, rhinoceroses. Later, during the Gravettian and Solutrian eras, most images were those of game animals hunted for food or skins, bison, aurochs, mammoths, and horses. Aurochs were an old fashioned cattle. Only a very small number of human figures have been found, either half human, half animal, or wounded humans. Two unique figures are the birdman in the shaft of Lascaux and the sorcerer in the Troa Frere cave. And we'll look at them later. Because most of the parietal art has been found in uninhabited caves that were used by small groups of one kind or another, it is probable that the caves were some sort of sacred sanctuaries. The engraved painting of the sorcerer in the chapel of the lioness with its votive objects, both discovered at the Troa Frere cave in Ariège, are clear indications of supernatural practices. Even so, interpretations vary greatly among archaeologists and anthropologists as to the exact meaning of parietal art. There are an amazing number of different ideas which are around and very few people can actually agree with each other. Some experts see it as evidence of shamanism or sympathetic magic. Others as evidence of rituals promoting fertility and successful hunting. Some think it had something to do with initiation ceremonies. Others see it as an attempt to contact the spirit world. Now here are the pic uh, map of the Paleolithic art sites. And you can see that there are most of them are in Spain, you know, lots of them in Northern Spain and uh, Cantabrian area. And then in France, Lascaux is here and uh, you have uh, Altamira is here. There's another important one, Neo, uh, and then Las, Las Grajas. And uh, then you have um, some German sites. Pavlov is a, uh, and Dolny Vecchonita is in Czech Republic and Moravia. Uh, you have uh, quite a lot of, one or two in Sicily. 
that is somewhere in, uh, in Bulgaria, and there are others in uh, Russia, and there are here several of them in uh, basically Israel or um, in the Middle East. There is even one in England. At that time, remember, England was connected to the continent because during the ice ages, the sea levels were 100 and 220 feet lower than they are today. And we'll look at it later and see what differences did that make. So it's a large number of sites. Here, and just a question again, a similar type of thing. These are the orientation culture, 47, 41,000 year. And the principal sites are here, Eastern Spain, Cantabria, the Pyrenees, Aquitaine, Burgundy, Languedoc, and so on. And we go on and on. This is Silesia and uh, the Eastern Slovakia. So you can see it going way out to uh, Don Valley, Ukraine. And here is 11 team origination. So there are a large number of sites and they have been discovered and they're still discovering them. Every year, another site somewhere in the world is being discovered. So now I'm going to go with the largest effect on these people by the ice ages, because most of them lived through the ice ages. Now, this is an interesting contemplation. <clears throat> the temperature of the planet Earth, and it's a kind of a discontinuous thing. Here you have from 500 million to 100 million years ago. And you can see the temperature is varying very, very large. Even here, around 300 million years ago, there were some ice ages. And uh, there was very, very cold. That was the snowball earth, as they called it at that time. And then from around 60 million years ago to around 10 million years ago, the temperature was very warm. This is 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs got extinct because an asteroid hit the world. And what you can see, the temperature was way up at average. Uh, if the 1960 to 1990 average temperature is here, zero, then this was 14 degrees Celsius above, very warm, tropical. The whole world was kind of tropical. And that's where quite a lot of our coal and so on got laid down. So then it got uh, kind of reduced and got cool, cooler. And from five million to around a million years ago, the temperature kept going down. And around here, it entered the ice ages around two and a half million years ago, where the temperature was much colder than it is today. And then from a million, to 20,000 years ago, you had actually the several ice ages. Every 100,000 years, roughly, there was an interglacial period like we live in now. And then the last 20,000 years was like this, and I'm going into more detail, but you can see the temperature warmed up to the present and so on. Now, this is an interest, more or less looking at the last 400,000 years before present. And you can see the temperature is going every 100,000 or so on years and going up and then it goes down. And that's the last age was here. And this is today's temperature, roughly around zero. But if you look at the last glacial thing, the temperature was warmer than it is today. So it's during these times, of course, when you were very cold, the sea levels were way down. And when it was warm, the sea levels came up because of course, so much of the ice was melting. The same time, the uh, carbon uh, dioxide concentration also goes with the same thing. When it is warm, it is larger. When it is cold, it is smaller. And uh, it's only now when it is going up very much, but our temperature doesn't seem to go up that much as it is supposed to go up according to all these uh, past experiences. 
And this is again, now our, our last eye stage. And you can see that this is what they call the Eemian integration, which was three degrees roughly about Celsius, according to around zero degrees now. So it was much warmer actually then than it is today. And uh, then the temperature dropped. It was quite cold here. Then it went up again, up again, down again, up again. And there was a large amount of, of uh, variation. And we look at the last 40,000 years or 45,000 years when actual cave paintings were produced from here to around here. And you can see overall the temperature was going down, but there were huge variations in the temperature. Now, uh, I want to show you the map of the world roughly during the last glacial maximum. And as I mentioned before, as during that time, large amount of the water was uh, bound up in ice, in the ice sheets, the sea levels were down by around 220, 230 feet below the present one. That means that all the <clears throat> areas around the, uh, the land were actually, which is today sea, were dry land. And for instance, the land between China and somewhere here, just somewhere part of Japan was a dry land. So was here between the Philippines and uh, Southeast Asia and between New Guinea and Australia. There was still an open ocean here. So anybody who managed to come to Australia from here had to have a boat or something to really come here. And we know that people did arrive here 50, 60,000 years ago. Now you can see something also interesting thing. Britain, of course, or England and Ireland were all connected to Europe. And at the same time, you could see that the Persian Gulf was completely dry. So for instance, if during 12,000 BC, there were some settlements here, we wouldn't know about them because they were underwater today. So this is a case which you have to be very, very careful. The Adriatic Sea was mostly dry land. And you can see that here. So was here is the Crimean Peninsula, the Azovian thing, all these things were dry land. So people could go from one place to the other and animals actually. So that's the reason we find uh, skeletons in England of uh, um, hippopotami and other things from early time because at a certain time they just could get there by land. Now here is a picture of Europe during the ice ages. These are the ice sheets. All that in Canada, of course, was under ice sheets. Right now, for instance, as we know, where Mount Royal is, there was a one mile high ice sheet. There was no vegetation, no animals, absolutely no life at all. Neither was here in the Scandinavia or Britain or Northern Britain. Here I was at the end of the ice sheets. The ice sheets sometimes came south when it was colder and then retreated when they were a bit warmer. There was a permafrost here. The Alps were also covered with ice. And so was the Pyrenees and, and some of these kind of mountains here. And you can see that out here was this kind of a steppe and um, dry land where big animals and games could roam. And there were some wooden uh, and uh, trees and forests around here in these areas. So you know, the climate was very, very different. And during this time, all our people here is Chauve, Lasco, Altamira. And so you can see that these are the different caves. And they are in the oh, close, all south of the Metropos line. So what really happens is that when the, um, and we'll see that when the uh, climate got colder, all these people came down here and into the caves. And that's the reason the caves were not always, uh, not continuously occupied, but sometimes they came in and sometimes they were not. In the times when the climate got warmer, 
they managed to get up here and they lived around here. Like in Neanderthal, they were found the Neanderthal skeleton. And that's where, of course, sometimes they were. Um, this is a map of the world showing the last glacial mushroom vegetation. And again, it shows you ice sheets are all here, North America, Montreal is somewhere here. And uh, this is a, basically tundra. And these are, uh, that's the deserts, both in Australia and so on. And then other things are tropical scrub and vegetation. And so you can see that it was a very, very different area and things than it is today. So when you go back to the ice ages, when the cave arts were actually made, these people had to deal with a very, very different surroundings and vegetation. Today, modern Europeans live in a paradise. For roughly the last 10,000 years, the earth has had a mild and stable climate, but this was not always thus. When you look back over the previous 100,000 years, Europe was a place of rapid and dramatic climate change, shifting from searing cold to balmy warms. Occasionally, these extreme changes in climate took place in less than a generation. Just over 40,000 years ago, the first modern humans advanced into this unpredictable northern land and they made it their own. Now here is the temperature in the last 50,000 years. And this input was came, coming, I just come from the GISPI score, which is taken from Greenland and it dates from 2000. And you can see that the temperature can change tremendously fast. Within a few hundred years, possibly, they can change from very quite warm to very cold. And people have to respond to that. I mean, the temperature changes are much, much, much larger than what we have today in the last uh, two, uh, 10 or 15 or 100 years. And so this is now what really happened here that the temperature around 12,000 years ago went up very much, then they dropped again very much around 11,000 years ago, which was called the Younger Dryas, and then suddenly started to go up. And from 10,000 years on, are you reasonably okay? But the temperature around here was warmer than it is today. Our temperature actually, since 5,000, 6,000 years ago, is going down here, getting colder. The Ice Age climate rendered vast tracts of the European landscape too cold and dry to permit tree growth. So in place of forests, the vast tracts of grassland and tundra. Plants from these two habitats met, mixed, and eventually covered much of the Eastern, Central, and Western Europe. This unique tundra steppe ecosystem thrived as the glaciers advanced and shriveled almost continuously. Now, well, here are the other picture. This is around the vegetation around 18,000 years ago. You can see that large amount is kind of desert. -ish. Very few forests. 8,000 years ago, the Sahara was not a desert and it, uh, forests came into being in most of Europe and North America. And today is again the same, except that the Sahara became a desert again and the Arabian Peninsula. So the difference between 8,000 years, and we'll see the differences when we look at the um, cave paintings, uh, I mean, the rock paintings at Tahili da Jalsea, which is somewhere around here. You can also see where you had mild glaciers with dense vegetation, or nearby refuge of pine and spruce, the interglacials became evergreen forests or permafrost-free solids, where very cold glaciers look something like that, very sparse vegetation, but then interglacials, the large forest, shrubs and uh, permafrost. So, so you can see that it is a very, very different thing. So when it gets cold, a bit warmer, 
cold, it's warmer, then it gets colder again, and these disappear, and that comes there. This happened all the time when our ancestors lived in those caves. The tundra steppe was an incredible rich environment. Also, the winters were harsh, the summers were not much cooler than they are today. Unlike the frigid Arctic tundra with the short summers and the restricted growing season, Ice Age Europe experienced the same long summers than European latitudes do now, because after all, the Earth is more or less directed in the same way, and the northern and southern hemispheres change the seasons uh, similarly. Spring and summer boasted plentiful sunlight and warmth, encouraged plant growth. The lush vegetation, which included grasses, herbs, and mosses, supported a vast menagerie of grazing animals. At times, Europe and Central Asia resembled the Serengeti, but instead this was an Ice Age Serengeti. Just as tundra and grassland plants came together to form the unique tundra steppe habitat, so animals from both the north and south colonized this bountiful new environment. For the first time, Arctic creatures like the musk ox, reindeer, and wolves mingled with typically African animals like lions and spotted hyenas. The result was an incredibly diverse mix of animals dominated by large herds of herbivorous megafauna, which are carnivores hunted in packs. Our own species, Homo sapiens, was just another pack hunting predator added to the mix. And this is a scene by Mauricio Anton in Northern Spain. You can see the mammoth and the rhinoceros, lions, horses, they all kind of coexisted together. And uh, we know that from, of course, uh, bones and so on, the remains of these animals at the different layers of uh, uh, excavations. So, but this megafauna was extinct quite often. And during the time of 56,000 to uh, 4,000 things, things came and went both in North America and also here. Around here, lots of things got extinct even before humans arrived in North America because of some different climates and different type of temperatures. And you can see the mammoth, for instance, got extinct around 8,000 years ago or 9,000 years ago. In Siberia, actually, it was uh, later than it uh, got extinct. And there are some very big uh, uh, deer and certain type of horses and so on this all got extinct. And what happened, for instance, is as the forest came, when it got warmer up, and the forest took over from the uh, tundra and the steppes, some of the big animals couldn't live there anymore. So they either had to move or they just got extinct. And that's how, for instance, all the big animals got extinct in North America and in Europe, or they had to move over to some steppe in the Asia, which uh, occurred. So that is one reason. So extinctions can be caused by one, an external events like an asteroid, which caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, or major climatic change, ice age changing to an interglacial is a much warmer climate changing the environment, or removal of an environment, for instance, deforestation, urban and suburban growth, and that is what causing the extinction caused today. It was mostly removal of the environment, not climate change at all. Our climate change is so small compared to these climate changes that it really will not cause extinction. One of the most intriguing questions in science today is not only what caused the extinction of the Neanderthals, but how did we interact with them? Was there any coexistence or was it just conflict? Undoubtedly, the arrival of a new species with similar habits and lifestyle would lead to a competition for living space and resources. But what was there an open aggression between the two species? Is it often imagined by popular media or was there just a gradual squeezing out as the numbers declined as ours grew? There must have been some peaceful contact in some areas as tantalizing evidence indicates that the Neanderthals were actually learning some of our tool-making techniques, 
and even attempted to mimic our jewelry. Whether they comprehended the significance of the jewelry is up for debate. It could well be that the Neanderthal's demise was far less dramatic than we like to think. Their extinction may have come about due to the advance of woodland from the south. It must be noted that despite the fact that they utilized trees as cover for hunting, they were not a purely forest species. As the trees continued to advance some 40,000 years ago, the Neanderthals retreated, unable to survive in the warm woodland environment. It is certainly a coincidence that at this time, modern humans were consolidating the hold on Europe, and we are able to take advantage of this brief warming of the climate, advancing alongside the woodlands as far as north of France and southern Poland. By 34,000 years ago, stone tools crafted by modern humans are found all across Europe, where the Neanderthal tools were by then confined to small regions, mostly the Iberian Peninsula. By the time the climate changed again to one that favored the Neanderthals, the former lands were occupied by us. Sadly, they no longer had any space to expand into, and by 28,000 years ago, the other human species had become extinct. Today, most Europeans have a one to 2% Neanderthal admixture in the genome. So we indicate that we did mix with the Neanderthals at that time, 34 to 28,000 years ago. So a little bit about migrations before we get to that. How did we get here? Well, we all know that um, out of Africa idea, that something like uh, originally in Southern Africa, 200,000 years ago, we had developed actually modern humans, then they moved up into kind of Northeastern uh, Africa. And around 70,000 years ago, the, from Northeastern Africa, they moved out and they went out to, to Asia first, and then occurs here and then to Australia. Remember at that time, quite a lot of the sea was dry land. And except for a small amount here, where they could have to cross by boat. Everything here was dry land. They also uh, went uh, with another idea that they went around here and they went up to Asia first. And uh, the modern humans then came also from here another one. This is part of these things of a Homo erectus, but these were modern humans here, the red. So uh, then it came first to Asia, but then it came to Europe around 40,000 years ago. Now, during the very strong cold ice ages, some of the Europeans later on came into Africa again, and certainly moved from here to Spain and in Italy, where you have called the refugees because to escape the ice ages, a very cold part of the ice age. And so this is the kind of uh, uh, movement, back and forth movement, which uh, occurred in the past. Early human migrations were the earliest expansion of archaic and modern humans across continents. They are believed to have begun approximately 2 million years ago with the early migrations out of Africa by Homo erectus. The initial migration was followed by other archaic humans, including Homo heidelbergensis, which lived around 500,000 years ago, and was the likely ancestor of the Denisovans, which are in Asia, and the Neanderthals, which are in Europe, as well as modern humans. But within Africa, Homo sapiens dispersed around the time of its speciation, roughly 300,000 years ago. The recent African origin paradigm suggests that the anatomically modern humans outside of Africa descend from a population of Homo sapiens migrating from East Africa roughly 70 to 50,000 years ago and spreading along the southern coast of Asia to Oceania by about 50,000 years ago, as I showed you. Modern humans spread across Europe around 40,000 years ago. Early Eurasian Homo sapiens fossils have been found in Israel and Greece, dated to 194,000 to 177,000 and 210,000 years old. 
respectively. These fossils seem to represent failed dispersal attempts by early Homo sapiens, who were likely replaced by local Neanderthal populations. Some of the caves in Israel, which they looked at, have several layers, and the very low layers have this very old uh, human uh, uh, remains, and then a higher layer have some Neanderthal populations, and an even higher layer, more recent, had some modern human populations. So you can see that the same caves were used in different type of population. The migrating modern human populations are known to have interbred with earlier local populations, so that contemporary human populations are descended in small part from regional varieties of archaic humans. After the last glacial maximum, North Eurasian populations migrated to the Americas about 20,000 years ago. Northern Eurasia was peopled about 10,000 years ago in the beginning of the Holocene. Arctic Canada and Greenland were reached by the Paleo-Eskimo expansion around 4,000 years ago. Finally, Polynesia was peopled within the past 2,000 years in the last wave of the Austronesian expansion. They mostly came from New Guinea, or from actually uh, Taiwan and some other parts. So these are the schematic map depicts a major migratory events that thought to have affected the gene pool of modern Europeans. Black arrows here yeah, indicate the uh, first settlement by modern humans around 45,000 years ago. Okay. At the end of the last ice age, around 10 to 15,000 uh, before present, Europe was repopulated by from glacial refugia, these red arrows. So people who actually moved down here from the uh, because of the glaciers repopulated because they, after they got warmer up, they could go up there. Around eight to ten thousand years ago, Neolithic farmers from Anatolia and the Fertile Crescent came into Europe. This image shows three skulls, approximately 31,000 years old, from Dolny Vestronice in the Czech Republic. This was a very important uh, um, uh, place where they found large amount of information about all the, how li people lived at that time. For the next 5,000 years, all samples analyzed in this study, whether from Belgium, the Czech Republic, Austria, or Italy, are closely related reflecting a population expansion associated with the Gravettian archaeological culture, which means that all these people moved around Europe and they were very similar. The ancient DNA shows that they are actually related, are very, very similar to each other. New genetic data published May 2, 2016 in Nature by David Reich revealed two big changes in prehistoric human populations that are closely linked to the end of the last ice age 19,000 years ago. As the ice sheets retreated, Europe was repopulated by prehistoric humans from southwest Europe, Spain. Then in a second event about 14,000 years ago, population from the southeast, Turkey and Greece, spread into Europe, displacing the first group of humans. And I'm going to give that lecture in the summer about this uh, ancient DNA. So here is, for instance, a map of showing where some of those uh, results from the ancient DNA came. And you can see that these are the color coded things. The red ones are the most recent ones, so 10,000 years ago. The black ones are 30,000 years. The blue ones are around here, around 28,000 years. And uh, then they have um, the green ones are around 15 to 18,000 years. So you can see that these are uh, different skulls and bones which were found at these places. This is Dolny Valchonica, and this is all, this is constantly, this is Malta, which is in Siberia, and they found something here, and they analyzed all these, and they found out that what was actually the DNA and how they were connected together. Very fascinating story. And now I think we should have a coffee break. 
um, because uh, I think we're not going to for two hours. We'll be probably <clears throat> finished, so it's enough time for questions. Good. Good. I, I'm just so amazed that there's there's so many cave paintings for one, and then how uh, in the last thirty years they've discovered many more uh, origins of different well different emplacements of men and so on. That I, I just you know I remember the story from uh, say years ago where basically there were humans and then there were Neanderthals, and it's such more it, it, it's so much more complicated than that now. <laughs> Well, it is, and, and they also discovered something like 50 different uh, skeletons of Neanderthals. So uh, now we know much more about them and you can analyze them and uh, to know when they lived and how they lived and things like that. Uh, well, first of all, anthropology and, uh, and archaeology is, there are many, many more people are involved in it. There's more universities who run it and there's a dating, which of course is, uh, uh, available, and that gives you much better ideas of what really happened there. But I guess you really can see the fact that uh, how all these external influences uh, basically uh, affected the people who lived there. I mean, temperature changes of, you know, from when change from a tundra suddenly become uh, 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 a forest. I mean, it's a huge change. I mean, we never experienced changes like that. I mean, if you look back, think about what Montreal was like 10,000 years or 15,000 years ago. It was, as I say, ice. Nothing, we nothing ice. Absolutely yeah. Nothing here. Yeah. 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 And uh, then it advanced and, and you can see that how those ice sheets went down to actually New York. You go to Central Park, and you see some of those huge rocks, which were carried by the ice sheets down to actually New York. Everything up here was uh, all glaciers. And uh, then they retreated back and forth and back and forth, depending on the temperature and so on. And, uh, but people couldn't live there. Well, actually, there were not too many people in, in the North America at that time. I'm wondering too about, um... The extensions, there were certainly the external factors, but as people left uh, Africa and lived in smaller communities, their gene pool was also smaller. And any change or even small mutations could have wiped out whole <laughs> settlements very quickly, even in one generation. We see this in the Saguenay region of Quebec where we have a smaller gene pool uh, than the rest of the world. And we see incidences in the world of diseases that uh, are one in a million or one in a hundred thousand, whereas in the Saguenay, it's like one in a thousand. So if the small gene pools were small settlements in caves uh, living all over the place, you could see how easy it might be for a, a little community to be wiped out very quickly with the smallest change and others taking That's over. Correct. But you know, there are also these bottlenecks in genetics, we yes. call it. We say that at a certain time, there was a, a very one or two, a few number of people survived, and then they had children. And so some of them, the whole gene pool from genome comes from that few people there. And uh, there are quite a lot of these um, bottlenecks around the, the world. And uh, so, genetic testing can kind of show that very easily. There are lots of fascinating stories about that. But anyway, okay, well, we should, um, we are not all here, but I guess we, most of us are here. So I'm going to continue. <clears throat> Harold has a question. And, uh, yeah. You're muted, Harold. We can't hear you, Harold. Yeah. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I noticed from one yeah. of the first presentations you uh, showed of the location of cave drawings that a very large number 
were in coastal uh, uh, regions related to the Mediterranean and parts of the Atlantic, with perhaps one exception in the interior of Europe and the, around Poland. Would that indicate more movement of people by boat rather than over land in that early period? Or is there some other explanation? Well, one big explanation is that people had to uh, live and they were hunting and fishing. And so lots of people were uh, around seashores where you could fish easily and you can survive from just uh, fishing. Uh, but uh, that is one um, reason for it. Uh, another thing is it was usually warmer around there and the coastline because mm -hmm. the sea, of course. Remember one other thing, uh, the sea levels were much lower at that time. So uh, those uh, places where may not be even on the sea Mm -hmm. Because um, if we, today it's on the sea, at that time it wasn't on the, at the sea. And also the sea was going up and down depending on the temperature changes and so on. So it was a very unstable period of time compared to today's when your temperature has been more or less steady for the last 10,000 years. We are very, very lucky, put it this way. <laughs> you don't know whether that will continue in the long run because up till now, every 100,000 years, there was an ice age. And we are very much due for another ice age. So we don't know what's going to happen. And uh, nobody can predict it at that point. OK, let me uh, go uh, on and continue. Okay, so now we come to the cave and rock paintings, finally. The oldest cave painting from Sulawesi, Indonesia, 44,000 years old. Well, some people claim it was only around 39,000 years old. But again, it's, it's one of the oldest one. And you can see that uh, you have uh, kind of uh, strange animals and you look at their feet and so on, but it looked possibly was a kind of a cow or something like that, that type of animal. But you can again see that there are some other smaller animals here, which of course were quite often, you can see them here. So it is, uh, even in Terra 3, Terra 4, and 5, and so on. And this is uh, the big one. And they're followed by small animals all around here. So you could see that 44,000 years ago, in, the, in Indonesia, there were already modern humans who painted the same way as basically people 10, 15,000 years later at Lascaux. And so it's very interesting to uh, find it out. Now, one of the oldest European cave paintings is uh, Chauvet Cave, which was one of the most recently found actually. And this is the area of the detail is right here in the Ardèche region of France. And there is Ardèche Gorge. And uh, this is one, and here is the cave which they found. The chauvet Pondard cave in the Ardèche department of southeastern France, cave that contains some of the best preserved figurative cave paintings in the world, as well as other evidence of upper periodic life. It is on a limestone cliff above the former bed of the Ardèche river in the Georges de, de l'Ardèche. Discovered on December 18, 1994, it is considered one of the most significant prehistoric art sites in the UN's cultural agency, UNESCO, granted it World Heritage status in 2014. The cave was first explored by a group of three speleologists, which are really cave uh, specialists, Elliot Brunet Deschamps, Christian Hilaire, and Jean-Marie Chauvet, for whom it was named six months after the aperture now known, Le Trou de Baba was discovered by Michel Rosa Baba. At a later date, the group returned to the cave. Another member of this group, Michel Chabot, 
Along with two others traveled further into the cave and discovered the gallery of lions, the end chamber. Chauvet has his own detailed account of the discovery. In addition to the paintings and other human evidence, so all the discovered fossilized remains, prints, and markings on a variety of animals, some of which are now extinct. Further study by French archaeologist Jean Clot has revealed much about the site. The dates have been a matter of dispute, but a study published in 2012 supports placing the art in the origination period approximately 32,000 to 30,000 years ago. The study published in 2016 using additional 88 radiocarbon dates showed two periods of habitation, one 37,000 to 33,000 years ago, and the second from 31 to 28,000 years ago, with most of the black drawings dating to the earlier period. And it's interesting to note that some of that habitations is connected with the coldest part or in, in a cold part of the climate, which means that people moved down into the caves from further up north and they lived there for a while. Now, the cave is close to the uh, most people. And so what they did, that they built a replica, which was under construction last year. Its area nearly the size of a football field, uh, based on 700 hours of laser scanning in the actual cave. So you can, this is a cave which you can visit and you can look at it and it, you have the same feeling as you would be in the actual cave with the painting, paintings on the wall and everything on there. It was a very expensive acquisition, but it, it had to be done because you couldn't allow people to go into the cave. They allowed them to go into Lascaux for some time and the cave paintings deteriorated considerably. These are rhino drawings from the Chauvet cave around 37 to 33,000 before present. And you can see the rhinos. These are absolutely gorgeous drawings. It is right thing. They are on top of each other sometimes. You are not quite sure whether they originally were drawn on top of each other or a next generation or came in and they drew more of them on the same time. But you certainly knew that these rhinoceroses were there at that time. This is a woolly rhinoceros in Chauvet. And you can see how wonderfully they even covered the wooliness of that rhinoceros. I mean, it's amazing. Be well done. This is an interesting one. It's kind of overlapping several of them in each other, like they would be coming on top of each other. Several of these things are there, but this is an unbelievable replica. Now, the woolly rhinoceros roamed around the steppes of Eurasia, especially in Siberia. It became extinct around 14,000 BCE. Most scientists believe it was due to climate change. The boiling aleroid warming created, that was around 14,000, 13,000 years ago, warming created much melted ice and snow together with increased forestation. Ancient DNA analysis showed that the herds were healthy around 18,000 BCE and coexisted with modern humans for 20,000 years. They do not think that they were hunted to extinction. They think that that went out because of climate change. These are horses from the Chauvet cave. And they're absolutely wonderful. Four horses on top of each other. And the colors and the way they look is just, as Picasso said, we haven't learned not anything in 12,000 years, but 30,000 or 40,000 years. The horses and camels originated in North America, crossed the Bering Strait to become ubiquitous on the steppes. They became extinct in North America at around 10,000 BCE. And that's the reason that the early uh, uh, Amaro Indians didn't have any horses. And only when the Spanish brought them back again, that the horses came back 
to uh, America. When after the ice ages, Europe became forested, the horses disappeared and retreated to the Eurasian steppes where they were domesticated around 3500 BCE. In Ice Age Europe, the horses were hunted and supplied around half of the meat eaten by the population. So uh, when after that the horses were domesticated by the people on the steppes, they also introduced the chariots with the horses and they all um, probably were around 3500, 3000 BCE when they started. But remember, Europe did not have any horses for a long time because it was mostly forested. Same in North America. Replica of a painting of lions. That's not the original, again, in the replica on them. And you can see the lions. Again, they are a pride of lions, actually. <laughs> there we go. And as I look at them, there are all kinds of female lions or whatever it would be today. But it's really amazing. These were predators at that time. So they were very much worried about them. Lions were ranging all over the warmer regions of Ice Age Europe. After the end of the Ice Ages, when the forests came back, they continued to be around the Balkans, Caucasus, and Anatolia. According to Greek art, there were lions in Greece around 400 BCE. Archaeologists found the bones of a lion in England and dated it back to 150,000 BCE. The lions were considered predators together with the cave hyena and the saber-toothed tiger. Here is a cave hyena, again from the Shobe cave. And again, you can see how well it was represented. It even had the dots on it. The artist who produced these paintings used techniques rarely found in other cave art. Many of the paintings appear to have been made only after the walls were scraped clear of debris and concretions, leaving a smoother and noticeably lighter area upon which the artist worked. Similarly, three-dimensional quality and the suggestion of movement are achieved by incising or etching around the outlines of certain figures. The art is also exceptional for its time for including scenes with animals interacting with each other. A pair of woolly rhinoceroses, for example, are seen butting horns in an apparent contest for territory or mating rights. The oldest known cave painting is an abstract sign, a red ochre disc of a dot, discovered at the El Castillo cave in Cantabria, Spain, which dates back to at least 39,000 BC. Not far from El Castillo is another ancient Spanish rock shelter known as Altamira Cave, where two abstract symbols, club-shaped images known as claviforms, have been dated to at least 34,000 BC. Remember, this is the same Altamira Cave where we see the bisons around uh, 13,000 BC, much, much later. It wasn't until 4,000 years after this abstract art that Stone Age artists began to paint pictures of animals. Even then, for every figurative image of a bison, a reindeer, or a bull, two abstract images were produced. The truth is, abstract symbols dominate parietal art, at least within the Franco-Cantabria region, both in terms of age and quantity. Unfortunately, Geometric images can compare with the beauty of figurative cave art as exemplified by the powerful bulls in the Lascaux cave paintings or the watching lions in the Chauvet cave painting. As a result, most symbols were ignored by early archeologists who dismissed them as no more than doodles. Even today, our interest in rock art is almost exclusively directed toward figurative painting and engraving. In a recent film, of the world famous Chauvet cave. For example, the film director totally ignored the abstract paintings on the walls as he moved from one animal picture to another. Lascaux. Lascaux cave is a complex of caves near the village of Montignac in the department of Dordogne in the southwestern France. Over 600 parietal wall paintings cover the interior walls and ceilings of the cave. The paintings represent primarily large animals, 
typical local contemporary fauna that correspond with the fossil record of the upper Paleolithic in the area. There are combined efforts of many generations and with continued debate, the age of the paintings is now usually estimated at around 17,000 years, early Magdalenian. Lascaux was inducted into the UNESCO World Heritage Sites in 1979 as an element of the prehistoric sites and decorated caves of the Vezere Valley. The original caves had been closed to the public since 1963 as the condition was deteriorating, but there are now a number of replicas. For instance, Altamira was also closed because there were something like 100,000 people came in a year. And then of course, it completely ruined things. Now they built a replica at Altamira, which is visited by two and a half, well, a quarter of a million people a year. So, you know, it's uh, very popular. Here is a reproduction again of the Lascaux artwork. You can see the horses. And also, it's a very interesting thing here. It looks more like an ostrich, very long neck. Not quite sure what it is. But it's, you can see there are also several dots here. They like to fill up all these dots. Lascaux also, the Megaloceros is a line of dots. Megaloceros was an extinct uh, deer, which was an amazingly huge uh, antlers. And uh, it's like, extinct by now. Again, you see there are some little funny things here and all these dots. You're not quite sure what it means. Another less archaic the section of the Hall of the Bulls. You can see it again that there are a large number of bulls and they are actually quite high up in the horses and they are quite high up on the wall. Up even here, there are some paintings. How did they get up there? We are not quite sure. Depiction of aurochs horses and the deer. Here are the aurochs, which are kind of cattle, old cattle, which are extinct, that curved uh, uh, horns, the horse, and here are some deer. You can see that. Here is another one of those strange animals with very long neck. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is. But, well, this must be a uh, Oh, no. Anyway, this is part of the Auroch. And here, I don't know what that is. Horse, maybe. A man wounded by spears. You can hear the man, and here are the spears going into it. And you can even penetrate them. This is the Pecmer cave in France. Note the abstract symbol, which called the aviform above his left of his head. You're not quite sure what it means, but it, in many, many caves, you have the same symbols. So that's a very few uh, human, actually, uh, <coughs> pictures. Pecmel is a cave which opens into a hillside at Cabrera in the Occitania region of France, one of the few prehistoric cave paintings and remain open to the general public. Extending over two kilometers over two levels, of which only around 1,200 meters are open to the public, are caverns, wells, and sloping tunnels, the walls of which are painted with dramatic murals dating from the Gravettian culture some 25,000 years BC. Some of the paintings and engravings, however, may date from the later Magdalenian era, 16,000 years BC. And you see, as in every cave, you have several layers of occupation. This is in pac a hand and dots. 
the hands and we'll see are very, very common. And this is actually a female hand. And you'll see later on that there is an interesting story that you can tell the female from the male hands because the two fingers are equal heights in females, but the male has a high, uh, the second one is lo longer than the, uh, this one. So you can always tell which was a female or a male hand from that. This is, you see, a male hand. This, this finger is higher than this one. Replica of horses and hands from Pac-Man displayed in the Bureau Museum. Again, lots of old things have been taken, the replicas, and uh, taken to different museums. Again, it's interesting to see that here's a horse, but it has all these dots on it. And then there's a hand. And that is universal. The hands all around the world in all the different caves. Now, geometric forms can be found in paintings as is Marsoulas in France. And you can see the geometric paint here. There are some things here and there are some lines with arrows on it, which either means for that people to go, oh, follow this line and go. There's some further stuff up there. Who knows what it means? And that is a strange, is all these little dots. Here's some other animals, horses. Now, that's an interesting find. An etched deer piece from a necklace at Saint Germain de la Riviere, France, 14,000 BC. They found it next to a uh, skeleton of a woman. And uh, unfortunately, the string which hold it together was gone. And so they are not quite, and they, when they took it out, they didn't really have the idea to keep them in an order. So we are not quite sure at what order they were, but you can see that they were all etched in different type of thing. And these etchings, are the same type of signs as you can find in other French caves nearby. So you wonder what exactly it, did it mean? An X or a, a several three lines, parallel lines. And these are the teeth of deer. And they were made into a necklace. Amazing. These are constantant doodles. They found out these are in Europe you have uh, all these type of doodles, which are consistent. You can find it in all different caves. You can see there is a heart, kind of, there's a Y, there are little uh, hands and dif different type of hands. And this is an heavy form and so on, star and whatnot. And you can find the si similar type of things in North America and in Australia and in Southern Africa. It's really amazing. You, have, you look at this little thing back and forth. Same thing here in Africa, in Australia, in North America, in South America. It's really amazing. You wonder in Central Africa. So you wonder where these things are, how come that the people in the caves and that all, all those people of different age types, much later, earlier, much later and so on, have the same type of uh, thing. They must have carried it with them from one place to the other. They must have some meaning, which we don't know what meaning it has. Uh, here is a red ochre stand stencils in the cave of El Castillo, 37,000 years, or in ancient culture. There are, so these markings are some of the earliest art of the upper Paleolithic. See, sometimes there are stencils, which means that they are actually uh, put the hand there and then they blow some things and paint around it. Some of the hands have actually painted hands, which they put paint on the hand and they put the hands on. But these are stencils.
Hence, Tenzi from Koska gave 25,000 BCE Gravettian culture. That's, that's in the National Museum of Archaeology, Saint Germain en Laye, France. This is the most wonderful museum in France. It is a National Museum of Archaeology, a large thing from all different caves and so on that put in here. It's the most uh, comprehensive museum of uh, all this prehistoric art and information. But you can see again the same thing. It's a stencil. The blue things around the paint. Now here is the Cuevo de los Manos in Santa Cruz, Argentina. This is now in South America. And look at the cave, look at the hands. Huge number of hands, of different type of hands. And uh, you can find out from this that they are a mixture of male and female hands. So, uh, Cueva de los Manos is a cave located in the province of Santa Cruz, Argentina, named from the hundreds of hand paintings stenciled into the multiple collages on the rock walls. The art in the caves date between 11 to 7,000 BC during the archaic period of pre-Columbian South America was the late Pleistocene, early Holocene. Several waves of people occupied the cave over time as evidenced by some of the early artwork that has been radiocarbon dated to about 7300 BC. The age of the paintings was calculated from the remains of bone made pipes used for spraying the paint on the wall of the cave to create the stenciled artwork of the hand colleges. According to Fanning et al, it is the best material evidence of early hunter gatherer groups in South America. The site was last inhabited around 700 CE, possibly by ancestors of the Tehuelca people. As far as age and gender are concerned, recent analysis of hand stencils has shown the paleorotic art, or at least the caves where the art was created involved men, women, and children. According to Professor Dean Snow of Pennsylvania State University, who studied the hand marks in the French caves of Pecmar and Gagas and the Spanish rock shelter of El Castillo, a strong majority of the hands belong to women. This research finding raised the possibility that the role of females in Stone Age art was greater than previously thought. Also, since we don't know for sure that hand paintings were created by artists rather than mere spectators, more evidence is required before a definite conclusion can be reached. We do know, however, that both handprints and hand stencils were left by cave dwellers of all ages, including children. Comparisons with present day ceremonies of Aboriginal people would indicate a shamanic background for these cave paintings. We do not know whether the artists were only men or some of drawings could have made by women. Paleoarchaeologists are divided about the purpose of these paintings. Some believe that they were made to help in the hunt. Others think they were painted more to describe the surroundings. Very few human figures are found in the cave art in Europe. This incredible cave art tells us that paleorotic artists were expressing themselves by telling perhaps important stories. Archaeologist Jean Claude and David Louis Williams suggested that these ancient artists were in a dream state or ecstatic trance that may have been due to fasting, dancing, or psychedelic drugs. The painted scenes, for instance, in the Kimberley Caves, involved mythical elements such as Evangina, cloud and rain spirits, and geometric patterns depicting shamanism. The practice of shamanism is prevalent among indigenous people, including Native Americans, Ainu, Buryats in Siberia, and some in northern parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Murmansk, or the Oblast of Russia. This practice is based on animism. Indigenous tribes believe that natural objects like plants, animals, and rocks possess a spirit. This is Evangina, also known as Gulingi, cloud and rain spirits from Australian Aboriginal mythology, depicted prominently in rock art in Australia. Some of the artwork in Kimberley region of Western Australia dates back to 4,000 years ago. Another closely related spirit entity of the creator being Wungul, a being analog analogous 
to the rainbow serpent in other Aboriginal people's belief, but with different interpretation. So you can see that all these things, a large number of cave art in uh, Australia, which goes back to 20, 30,000 years ago. Also. Now we have bison human and lion human terrian troupe in the Chavot, France. Here is a bison head and a human. Teleontropy is the mythological ability of human beings to metamorphose into other animals by means of shape shifting. It is possible that cave drawings found in Le Trois Frères in France depict ancient beliefs in the concept. The best known form of teleontropy is found in stories of werewolves. Ethnologist uh, Ivor Listener theorized that cave paintings for beings in human and non-human animal features were not physical representation of mythical shapeshifters, but were instead attempts to depict shamans in the process of acquiring the mental and spiritual attributes of various beasts. Religious historian Mercia Eliade has observed that beliefs regarding animal and identity and transformation into animals are very widespread. And we know it happens in Greek mythology, in Nordic mythology, and in many, many cases. Sun rock paintings, paleontrope and shamans, South Africa in the 19th century. So you can see the same type of rock painting, which you can see in Europe. But now this is our 19th century in South Africa. This is a famous sorcerer in Troyes, France, 13,000 BCE. You can see it's a head of an anther and a kind of a human legs. Very interesting. And this is the humanoid terrian troop. There's a grouse and a bison. This is from Lascaux. And this is a bird head, this human, this landing on the ground, and it looks like a bison is attacking it, or at least maybe killed it. We are not quite sure. So now we go over to Africa, to Tassili, Niger. It's a vast desert plateau in southern Algeria, stretching on the borders from Niger to Libya, to the east, to as far as Amgrid in the west, covering the area 72,000 square kilometer. Thousands of years of changing Saharan climate and erosion have created stunning geological features, with towering sandstone pillars, deep canyons, and more than 300 natural arches. Um, they shut in the world by fame in 1930s, not for its landscape, but with precious collection of ancient rock art in the area. Since the discovery, more than 15,000 petroglyphs and paintings have been identified, representing 10,000 years of human history and environmental change. One of the most striking feature of these petroglyphs is the way they evolved this change of climate. It is a petroglyph depicting a possibly sleeping antelope They're located in Nigeria. Look at that. It isn't that absolutely wonderful. Modern art couldn't do it better. Well, not even modern art, but actually 19th century art. The oldest art belongs to the so-called large wild fauna period, 10,000 to 6,000 BC, characterized almost entirely by engravings of animals such as hippopotamus, crocodiles, elephants, giraffes, buffaloes, and rhinos, depicting an abundant wildlife at a time when the Sahara was green and fertile. Humans appear as tiny figures dwarfed by the immensity of these animals and are often shown holding boomerangs or throwing sticks, clubs, axes, or bows. Now, it just shows you that 18,000 years ago, at the last maximum global, it was a desert climate, which it is more or less today. But 8,000 years ago, it really was a kind of steps savanna down here, and actually uh, more steps up near the falls. 
So you can see that it was forested here. So there was a big change. And today, of course, it's desert again. There was just small desert area. So the climate can change pretty fast and it can change very rapidly, uh, very uh, amazingly. Okay, so here are some of the pictures. There are some animals, which are, and the human beings. There are many human beings here. And look at the animals here. These are kind of giraffes, kind of, or whatever animals they are. It's human beings with some bows and arrows, hunting. Overlapping with this area is a round head period, 8,000 to 6,000 BC, where human figures were elaborate at Dias loop dominance. These figures range from a few centimeters to several meters tall. The majority of round head paintings portray people with round featureless heads and formless bodies. Some of these pieces seem to suggest shamanism with bodies flying through space or bowing before huge male figures that tower above them. About 7,000 years ago, domesticated animals began to appear in the art. This period is known as the pastoral period. Rock art from this period reflects a changing attitude towards nature and property. Human figures became more prominent and man was no longer shown as part of nature, but portrayed as being above nature, yet able to derive sustenance from it. Wild animals gave way to cattle and stock. Later drawings, 3,500 years ago, depict horses and horse-drawn chariots. It is unlikely that chariots were ever driven across the rocky Sahara, so researchers believe that figures of chariots and armed men are symbolic, representing ownership of land or control of its inhabitants. As the climate became progressively drier, horses were replaced by camels, as evident from the rock art from the most recent period about 2,000 years ago. Here is a camel. And you can see that people have now more, more modern people. Here are some more older paintings of all different old animals, giraffes actually. This painting shows that the region of Tassil in Nigeria had a much more benign climate where animals which could not survive today's desert were around. As we saw above, the present day site was in savanna type surrounding. The paintings also show many human figures in all different activities. One of them even shows them during sexual intercourse, which is very unusual for that, but it does show them. So now a little talk about mobiliary art. This is a Venus of Berakat Ram, 232, 500 BCA. There's a big argument going on whether this is a natural uh, rock or it was formed by humans. Some people claim that they can detect some working on it. And uh, so it may be humans, but yeah, still people are arguing about it. This is a Venus of Tantam in Morocco, 200 to 500,000 BCE. This is definitely a human figure. So even at that time, this was actually possibly archaic humans, but possibly more modern humans who came in, we are not quite sure. Lion human of Hohenstein Stadel, close up of the upper half. This is 30,000 BC in Ulm, Germany. This is an ivory. Look at the lion and the human body down here. So this is again one of those stereotropes. Beautiful thing, I think. 30,000 years. Here's one of the world's oldest figurative carving, 35 to 40,000 BCE. It's obviously a woman with huge breasts, little head. And it's obviously a figure of um, fertility symbol. Venus of Dolny Vestonice. Remember I mentioned Dolny Vestonice in the um, Czech Republic? Uh, this is 26,000 BCE. It's in Vienna now. 
And again, you see that it's obviously a Venus figure, as I call it. This was already a, a normal head and breasts and so on. Venus of Willendorf, 25,000 BCE. Another, you can see the hair actually there. Again, uh, probably a fertility figure. One of Malta's Venuses found in, in near Irkutsk, Siberia, it's in the Hermitage, St. Petersburg. Kind of a, a face already there, if you see it. And the folded arms, kind of a praying. Venus of Brassenpol, 23,000 BC, oldest known Stone Age portrait. Look at that. Isn't that. You can see that it's covered by a shawl or something like that. I'm not quite sure. Must be hair, very long hair, actually, because there wasn't any shawl at that time. And it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful piece of thing. And so I compare it with carved mid-century modern theme wood sculpture. And I think this is more beautiful. And to end the whole thing again is Picasso. I started with Picasso. Picasso is portrait again, where he was his cubist period replacing everything. And if you think about all the beautiful portraits and uh, things which were done in the 19th century or the Greeks or so on, we came a whole world around going from this thing to this thing. Okay, text and picture of this presentation were taken from Wikipedia and from Art Encyclopedia. Pictures and books were shown from Amazon CA. You. And that is my presentation. I hope we have enough time now to have some questions. I hope you liked it and got some more information. I try to not only look at cave paintings and cave art, but put it into a perspective in somehow of how these things occurred, how these people lived at that time, and what type of uh, what conclusions possibly we can draw. Even today, most archaeologists and or paleoarchaeologists or whatever they call themselves, anthropologists, violently disagree with each other about what are those paintings, who made them, and what happened, and, and things like that. And uh, so um, one day, maybe we can um, come to a conclusion, but not yet. Okay. So, anybody? Hands up? Questions? Wonderful presentation, John. I have just, it's just so much information. It was so beautifully done. Uh, I was uh, curious as to why we don't see any fish on the cave walls when they were fishing at some point, I imagine. Uh, I don't know. Uh, most of the people who uh, did the cave paintings obviously were inland and they didn't fish, but we know actually uh, from certain materials which they had that they had a trade going on between certain places inland or near the seashore where certain elements for uh, the tools were made. And, uh, and so we know that there was communication and trade between them who were inland and some people near the seashore. So why there are no fish actually? Nobody asked that question yet, I think. I never, actually I have not uh, read quite a lot of stuff, but I never, heard anybody even thinking about that question. Great, great, <laughs> Beverly. But it's uh, very interesting. Yeah? Angie. She has it, Angie. You're muted, Angie. Unmute yourself.
Mm, okay. Uh, would you happen yeah. to know how old the Australian cave uh, paintings are? How old? Yeah. Uh, well, some of them are thousand. actually, uh, some of them are around uh, uh, 35,000 years old. Oh, okay. uh, and, uh, but you know already that uh, as in Sulawi, they have more than on the 44 or 40,000 year old cave mm -hmm. paintings that in Australia, uh, the people arrived more or less at the same time and in New Guinea and in Australia also. So some of the cave paintings in Australia are back to 35,000 years. Uh, um, they are not similar cave paintings than one that you saw in Sulawi, but they are more kind of whitish and uh, engravings and things like that. Um, thank yeah, you. Is that thank answers you. your question? Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Alina. Fish are very rare in cave paintings, but they're not totally unknown. I don't remember the exact location, but there are some from Southern Africa. And if you Google, you should be able to come up with them. I'd have to check my notes and I don't have them easily accessible. There are not very many, but there are some. Yeah. You say they are in Southern Africa. And yes. how old are those? And how old are those uh, cave I, That cave again, cave I cave. just don't remember without checking my notes. Yeah. But they are, I mean, they're within the range of what you're, I mean, they're certainly in the thousands. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Timmy. Uh, excellent presentation, John. Thank you. Um, many of the, of the images reveal where maybe Picasso derived his inspiration. <laughs> many, many of the pieces of cave art almost look, really do look like works of Picasso. <laughs> I, found that, I found that very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah well, I, I couldn't resist showing some Picasso there, <laughs> especially as he claimed in the beginning that his art is uh, as good as uh, uh, Lasco, and which is actually true. That, if you that, see uh, exactly. Picasso, he knows how, he knew how to paint if he wanted to. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good, thank you. Yeah. Rick, Rick. Yeah, John, my, my question is, uh, when, you, when you talked about the different time periods and some of them were very significant, uh, chunks of time and you showed a number yeah. uh, you showed a, a, a one of them that had a, um, a lots of different uh, examples of cave paintings within that time period um, I'm just wondering to what extent was it all part of a similar culture or, or are all these sort of one of within that time period uh, and uh, are there similarities between the cave paintings in that time uh, the symbols used were there similarities between the the uh, um, the symbols used uh, or there are they sort of one of but in that same time period well the time periods were actually uh, uh, by archaeologists uh, looking at uh, tools and the, of which the people used at that time and how the different uh, tools changed uh, uh, in uh, this time. And uh, it all goes back to the before dating actually or when the people tried to differentiate one time period to the other time period. But uh, as far as uh, science are concerned, no, there is no real difference. Uh, you already have, for instance, in the very early caves, the red dots. And those red dots are then later on in some most recent caves, also in 10,000 years ago or so on. Uh, there are also these other little squiggles or whatnot, which as I showed, they are in all around the world. So there are some similarities within, somehow there's the same culture which managed to uh, uh, communicate with each other. And I'm quite sure these people did communicate. Now, the interesting thing is that the cave paintings all around the world started around 50,000 years ago with what they call the modern, anatomically modern humans. There are some indication in Southern Africa 
that you have some ostrich shells which were actually marked and uh, and uh, with uh, ink, I mean, or red ochre. And there is also some indication in Southern Africa around 70, 80,000 years ago that red ochre, which people usually mined, were carried from one place to the other. You mined it in one place. And if it was a different type of ochre than what you wanted to use, you heated that ochre by fire to conform, uh, to change it into a different type of ochre and uh, which you could use actually either for body painting yourself or on the, on the walls or something like that. So these people 70, 80,000 years ago in Southern Africa already had the knowledge or the, put it this way, of how to heat and change ochre from one type of ochre to another ochre and to use ostrich shells and uh, mark them. People think that the markings were due to saying that this is mine. And so it's kind of another type of early uh, idea of uh, property or something like that. But uh, overall, after 40,000 years or so on, all these paintings are very, very similar to each other. So and, uh, John, is this a sign? <laughs> Is this a sign of movement from, from place to place? And, and, and you might have brought a certain knowledge of drawing from one place to another. Is this a sign of movement, a communication yes, and movement? I, I think it's a, a sign of, um, of ideas that people, uh, how would I say, that culture was uh, kind of continuous. So people, even if they were not in the caves at that time, then you and how to do things. You didn't have to reinvent it again. And uh, somehow, well, remember another thing. The caves which we have now are lucky finds because 20,000 or 18,000 years ago, there was a landslide and the entrance to the cave was blocked. So nobody could get in there. And so we had to discover that. And these things have been pres uh, preserved. But we know from other cases that people were putting drawings and so on on rock faces, open rock faces. Now, on an open rock face, uh, it will disappear with time because of the climate, with the wind, with the rain, and things like that. So. Possibly there were a continuity between the early one caves and the later caves we see, but they were not in caves, but in rock faces where they have been uh, painted. Also, you know that there are hundreds of thousands or millions maybe of people lived in between 40,000 and 10,000 years ago, but we only find one or two uh, skeletons because obviously the only thing we find is the one which was by chance preserved and preserved by uh, either a very dryness of the climate or it was uh, by chance co covered somehow. But most of the skeletons and so on, even the buried ones disappeared. So uh, very lucky when we discover something which we can date and we can look at it. So yes, I think there was a continuity of culture and people moved around quite a lot actually. Uh, John, is there any indication of what sort of a tool or utensil were used for the painting, the cave paintings? For example, were they finger paintings? Were there brushes or other tools that were used? There were no brushes. There, were, um, there are some indication of finger movements and so on. Some mm. paint which was spread by a long thing by fingers and so on. Then, of course, there was a uh, as you notice, the hands, stencils was done, and somehow the paint was sprayed around it. So there were little pipes, mm -hmm. which you could put paint in it and then blow. So some yeah. of the, paint, the paintings were kind of blown there, and that's right. how it was done, or they were done by hand. But I don't, I don't think they had brushes or anything of that sort. Sure. I have to add that I've had the, the wonderful experience of visiting a cave with drawings on them uh, just off the south coast of Sicily. 
and it's really quite amazing. And, and, and you brought out just how extensive that type of art is. Thank you for a great presentation. Okay, well, welcome. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Well, if, if nobody is going to ask any more questions, then I'm just going to mention one more thing that these people who uh, uh, lived in these caves have actually, uh, were the people who originally moved in into Europe. But again, they had to continuous movement back and forth, depending on the glaciers coming down or the glacier, or glaciers going back and, and, and so on. For instance, you found out just to show how things change that when recently, uh, some of the glaciers retreated in the Alps because of the bit warming temperature, they found tree trunks of pines underneath the glaciers, which were dated to something like seven, 8,000 years ago. So would it indicate that at that time, the temperatures was warmer up in the Alps, where there were glaciers just around 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and there were pines growing there. So you can see that these things, uh, climate changes all the time back and forth. We also found out that when the glaciers retreated now, that there were villages or looks like some type of villages which were there a couple of thousand years ago, where the, when it was warmer at the Roman times, people lived there, then the glaciers later come in and overtook the whole thing. And for a long time, they were, you couldn't get to it. Now that the glaciers go back again, same type of thing. So you can see, this is a type of change in climate, which is perfectly natural. And it occurs in certain times. Uh, we are trying to make it a big issue now out of it, but uh, it's going to, it happened in the past. It will happen in the past. And then probably another ice age is going to come. We are not quite sure when, uh, but uh, usually cold periods in history are much more detrimental to human existence than warm periods. And that's what we found out from archeology, span that whenever there was a warm period and warmer period, cultures thrived much more than under cold periods where you have famines and all the other type of problems with people. So, uh, uh, th all these type of things will tell us when we look in the past, will certainly illuminate our present and say something about the future. John, there's actually another question in the uh, chat from Janet, and it, you haven't quite covered it there. She, she asked what materials were used for the pigments. You didn't mention ochre, but I wonder if there's any other material pigment sources of the pigments for the uh, paintings. Yes. There was magnesium, and it was okay. uh, used for that. The red paint was, of course, ochre. The black paint was uh, just uh, uh, burnt uh, uh, wood, if you want to call it. Charcoal. And, uh, and the white ones were especially magnesium and other type of thing. So which they got it from uh, certain, again, the, quite a lot of things were traded. And uh, ochre wasn't at, at every place. So you had to kind of trade this from the other one. It's like uh, later on lapis lazuli, which they used in beautiful sculpture, I mean, and in, in, in uh, necklaces and so on, but traded all across Europe and in the Middle East. So trading has been going on for a very, very long time. Actually, uh, I'm planning another Friday lecture in the fall, which I'm going to just uh, going to propose now, about the Indus Valley civilization, which in, had a tremendous trading background between Sumer and uh, all the type of thing in around 2000 BCE. And uh, so that trading has been a very, very old thing between humans. But anyway, that's just for the future. <laughs> um, you know, the trouble with MCLL is that you have to plan so far ahead. I mean, I'm getting now the information that I have to, provo to propose for the fall. I mean, I haven't even finished. I'm finishing the 
spring session. I just proposed for the wonderful Wednesdays. Now I have to go to the fall. Well, it's, that's the way we go. But thank God for MCLR. <laughs> I think Marie Ellen okay. has a question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, John, uh, this has just been a, a wonderful experience. I'm just delighted. And I'm, I'm happy to know that there will be more in, in the fall that we can look forward to. Tell me, is there anything in the summer? Yes. Yes, I mentioned to you that there is going to be a, a, about ancient DNA, which I'm going to do, okay. which is which I mentioned before, which actually was connected with the movements of people into Europe and into Asia. They found out, for instance, uh, where the people who went to New Guinea came from, or from, from the Polynesian islands and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. They also found out of interesting things about the uh, Americas when people came and uh, where they actually came from and, and so on. So yes, I'm going to talk about that in the uh, wonderful Wednesdays. Wonderful, thank you very much. Besides, besides a couple of other lectures, which I, uh, I will have. <laughs> I'll to be do watching. With that. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, take care. Anyway, uh, so thank you very much for attending. And- uh, Thank you very, very you much. Enjoy. Thank you, John. You can. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, John. Have a nice weekend. Thank, Thank you so much, John. Bye -bye. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you.